information about him I will share with you, and then I will let him uh, take a floor. Uh, I gave you all an evaluation, and if you would complete that at the end and give it back to me as you leave the room, I would greatly appreciate it. So, um, Bob has worked in counseling as a master's level psychologist and a licensed master's social worker since 1976. He developed a course in stress management that he teaches at LCC, and he continues to teach it online now for us. He is the author of Slow Down and Lighten Up, Letting Go of Stress and Tension, and is currently writing Practical Psychology. And he's also working on children's stories on the same topics, which I think sounds really interesting. He has given hundreds of presentations to professional organizations, community groups, human service agencies, healthcare providers, businesses, and government agencies um, over the last 37 years. And we're pleased he's here with us today. So here's, I'll let Bob take the floor. Welcome. Um, Margaret Adler once said that a lecture is the process of taking what's in the notes of the instructor and putting it into the notes of the student without passing through the mind either. <laughs> now, I, have a, I have a lot of information to share, um, and so obviously most of the talking, there isn't the time for the interaction that I, that I really love in the classroom, but hopefully at the end we will have some time, because I want to give you a complete picture. Um, but I do have, uh, each have a copy of the handout, and it's very complete. I spent a lot of time making sure that most of what I'm talking about here will be in the handout. So I would encourage you not to take notes. I would really like to have this be more of an experiential process. And actually, if you like, I also have my uh, outline. I have a few copies with me, but it will be on the website, and you can download that. And I also um, I have 20-some videos that I made for the course I teach. They're also on my website, so you can watch the videos and they teach the same approaches and techniques. So because when you write some, something down or you're taking notes, it starts you thinking. And thinking is different than receiving and learning. It <coughs> narrows it, okay? It's the difference between a conceptual process and an experiential process. And I really uh, believe, and in, in, in my experience is that we learn much more efficiently through experience than we do through concepts. And what happens with concepts, particularly like in my field of psychology, people get this idea of how it's supposed to be, and then they're sitting in front of a person and they try to plant the idea on the person, and it rarely fits. Okay? And what, you, what I find is much more effective is you start with the person, and then you reflect. Then you use your thinking and your conceptualization. And now you have a window that's opening rather than one that's already defined in its frame. Okay? So I'm hoping that this becomes more of an experiential process um, rather than a, than a conceptual process. And that's another topic I could really go on about that for a little bit. Um, but I won't. Okay. Um, I worked with a man once who had been in seclusion for 30 years. This was in the 1970s. Okay. From the age of 12 until the age of 42 when I met him, he had been alone in a locked concrete block room with an iron door. They fed him like an animal. They opened the door, put food on the floor, and told him to quit. Because any time he had human contact, never did an attack the whole 30 years, every time. They had held him in restraints for three years. They got him into a straitjacket. And the state of Michigan came out with the mental health code in the 70s, and it became against the law to do that. You just can't, you just have something tied up. You know, you just want to go up and get an ass to shoot him. But anyway, um, they transferred him up to the uh, facility where I happened to be working because we had a small psychiatric unit. And uh, they wanted to see if they could find some drugs or something that would calm him down enough. And they asked me to consult. I was working with another unit. They asked me to consult because I had a lot of success working with problems with people with problems with violence. And uh, in the process of bringing him into the building, uh, there were, he was a small guy. He was like 125 pounds, maybe this tall, kind of wiry. Okay. In the process of bringing him into the building, we had 700 staff at the facility, and they found the four biggest, strongest, okay, to take him from the vehicle into the, our old seclusion room because they didn't know where else to put him. Okay, and those are all windows at this height in the hallway, he put out three of them to speak. Just really, really intense kind of thing. Um, I spent uh, well over an hour, I went out to the woods and spent an hour getting into balance. Because I learned that's 
what worked when I was dealing with people who were patrol the positive eight or five. So I, I made sure that I was as clear and as calm and wasn't coming in with my own agenda to start. And I simply opened the door, okay, and I stepped in, and this was the stance I'd always use when someone was out of control. Okay, because I can't throw a blow in this stance. It's interesting, the Department of Mental Health taught us to go in like this. <laughs> it's the exact opposite of what you want because now I'm ready to play. Okay, but here I can't throw a blow, but I can move real quick. Okay, so if they come at me, I can go this way, I can go basketball. And, and it was never hit in many years of, of doing this work. So, um, so we stand here like this, and he's pacing on the other end of the room, just back and forth, back and forth. And we, no one even knew if he understood my English. I mean, they had no, you don't give up now like that in a toughness test. Okay, they knew nothing. Um, they didn't know if he was schizophrenic, he was now retarded. They had no idea what was going on with this person. Okay, he was just pacing back and forth. And so I'm just standing there and looking and talking, saying, you know, my name's Bob and I work here and I wanted to see if maybe I could help you out a little bit. And, and I picked up that he must have had an excruciating head. I've never seen that much tension in a person's forehead that could take many toes before. It was just, you know, just incredible. And so I picked up on that and said, gee, I wonder if you've got a headache. Um, and it didn't matter to me whether he understood the language because I worked with people who were profoundly impaired and the tone of the voice, and there's many ways of communicating these signs through, you know, through, through words. Um, and so I picked up and said, you know, I know something about headaches. Uh, I work with tension a lot. Sometimes that causes headaches. If you want to sit down, I can give it a try and see if it'll help. And he sat down. First time anyone knew that he had language. And I tried to work on it because connected shoulders are nice for what they're working on. This and it's, it's not that hard. Um, it didn't have any effect. And I sat down next to him and you know talked a little bit and he just looked straight ahead, kind of down, and I couldn't think of anything else to do, so I got up and walked out. And there was a whole crowd around the room. And the nurse who had admitted him was just saying, Oh my god, I can't believe that. That's never happened. And there was a brand new staff person. I was 19 years old, I'd never seen him before. Uh, he just finished his training, and he said, that's nothing. And he walked in and did the same thing. Actually, he took it, I mean, he didn't use the same approaches, but he sat down next to the guy and talked to him, and he took it a step deeper, because I tuned into his pain, but this guy tuned into his loneliness. His loneliness, his profound loneliness. And he wound up being assigned full-time to this person, and for the next month, that's all he did. He could come and go as he pleased and just hang out with this guy. And unfortunately, they sent him back to his original facility because that was the zip code he came from. And so, but I happened to see him two years later. I was at that facility for another reason. And I went by to that unit to check it out. And he was back in the seclusion room, but the door was open and the lock was off. And he could come and go. He didn't acknowledge me at all. Um, but that's 30 years. What was happening? What caused that? Okay, I'm going to say it was a lack of balance on both sides, but particularly on the staff people. Okay, they came in ready for a fight. Okay, they came in ready to handle this guy. I'm going to. This is a dangerous situation. I'm going to be in control. They came in afraid. What is he doing? He reacts to that. All of a sudden, for 30 years, every human contact came in with that. In balance. All of a sudden, twice in one day, two guys come in relatively in balance, and he doesn't fight. Okay. Balance can make that profound of a difference. And the thing about being out of balance is you don't know when you're out of balance because the first thing you lose when you lose balance is awareness. <laughs> I call it delusions of adequacy. Okay. <laughs> you think you know what's going on. I remember once um, we were building, uh, I built our own house, and uh, we were living in a mobile home at the time, and I was uh, working on the basement. We lived in the basement for three and a half years, so I worked my way up. And uh, I had to hang a ceiling fan because I had some guys coming over to do some work in the back, and they needed heat, and I needed to build a fire in the wood stove. And I came home from work, and I had a meeting to go to, and I was tired, and I thought, okay, if I really hurry up, I can get that up. And then I can just go to bed when I get home. I can build a fire when I get home, turn on the fan, go to bed. And so I hurry up, got it up, ceiling fan up, go to my meeting, come back exhausted. I look at the, go to build a fire, and I put the fan right above the stove. Oh, that's 
there'd be a lot of heat. I called my neighbor, who was a maintenance man at Dow, and said, is that a problem? Yeah, you gotta move it. It's one of these old fire, and you're gonna go Okay, how far away do I have to move it? I'll measure how far away to move man there. Hook it all up, I'm really exhausted now. We get the fire going, the guys come to the work. I come home from work the next day to check on it. My wife comes in with me and she says, why'd you hang it there? Being out of balance, my focus was this far away from the stove, not this is going to be our living room for three years. <laughs> or it would be nice to have a fan. You don't think about those things when you're out of balance. Okay? So I want to break this down into body, mind, and perception, and emotion, and you have to get a sense of the whole picture and how they relate. Okay? And the real key that I found very consistently over 37 years of counseling is to start with the body. They talk about mind over matter, but it is way more efficient to start with the body, and I'll explain why. Okay? What happens in the body, very specifically, is your body gets ready for action when you're out of balance. That's what throws us out of balance. And it gets down to the level of the autonomic nervous system. Okay? They call it the fight or flight response, I call it crisis mode. Okay? When you perceive a threat, and when you're exhausted, your body builds up tension. Okay, because you push yourself to keep on going, and it's the same thing as if you're pursuing a threat. Okay, if you've gotten by on less than six hours of sleep for two or three days, you're building up tension. You're not aware of it because tension diminishes our awareness. Okay, but what's happening is your sympathetic nervous system is being overcharged. It's working all the time because you're pushing your muscles to get moving. Okay, so in crisis mode, all of the maintenance work in your body shuts down. Okay, that's suppressed. So the energy can go to the muscles so you can get away from the bear. Okay? And what happens then is, is that if you start to get tired, you can't say, hey, wait a minute, bear, I'm going to take a rest here. Okay. The bear is still coming. Okay? So your body adjusts to that by giving you stress hormones okay, that ramp up the whole system, keep the sympathetic nervous system charged so you've got more and more energy. So as soon as you start to, to build up that tension, you get a self-escalating process. So the, the more tired you get, the more you push, and then you can't sleep, so you're getting more tired, and it just keeps on escalating. Okay. So the level of the autonomic nervous system, you've got the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. This part activates your muscles, this part does maintenance work. Most of you know more about this than I do, and I'm going to use some oversimplification just to save time, so forgive me on that. So what happens is sympathetic nervous system gets stuck on. Okay. Now, that's going to affect your mind. Your mind goes into crisis mode, what does it do? Okay. It senses the buildup of tension. What's wrong? Okay. See me tense up? Okay. What's wrong? Your mind focuses narrowly on what's wrong. Okay. We have a lot of deer in our area, and uh, I can see them in the mm -hmm. living room window almost any day. And I remember once I had with a dog, a, 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 a doe, very close by. And I, I was looking at her through the window, and I kind of over a moment. She just froze. And my dog came running along the side of the house and got closer <laughs> to a deer than he ever had in his life because she was so narrowly focused on me. Okay? It narrows the focus on the potential threat. Now, if you're not being chased by a person or, or a, a bear or anything like that, you're looking for threats. So is that the threat? Are you the threat? Are you the threat? So your mind can scatter. The lot of it's narrow. It doesn't take in the whole picture. That's a parasympathetic nervous system activity. Okay? So when you're out of balance, your focus is narrow on the danger. So you start thinking about everything that's wrong, and if there's nothing wrong in this minute, you think about what could go wrong in the future or what did go wrong in the past. Okay? And those thoughts create more tension. Okay? So now you've got that part of the thinking process. Okay? Emotionally, now here's a, some information about emotions that, that most people aren't aware of because it, psychology doesn't do a good job of explaining it. It's kind of they're based on research and they're trying to base it on the brain and we don't know that much yet. Okay? But on an experiential level, emotions are actually pretty clear cut. Okay? There's four kinds of emotions and they're described in your handout. The first is what I call a momentary emotion. It's just a natural response to what you're perceiving at the moment. That's the everyday emotion that you have in any situation. It's a momentary thing. It lasts the fraction of a second. Okay? It can change that quickly. So a good example is going to a funeral. 
you walk in feeling really sad and alone and isolated, you've lost this person that's very close to you, and you connect with other people, someone tells a funny story, you all laugh, and you have a sense of connectedness with everyone, and, and there's a smile on your face, okay, and you're having fond memories of it. Emotions change that quickly, okay, that's their nature. Now, the other thing important to remember about emotions is their physical experiences. We experience an emotion in our body, okay, and they're in the muscles. Okay, there's a link, well established in <coughs> my research, between proprioception, proprioception, muscle movement, and emotion, and experience of emotion. And people who have Botox don't have the emotional expression of their face, okay, and they have flatter emotions, they have less experience of emotion because the muscles don't move. Tension will do the same thing. Okay, so if I tense up in response to emotion, I'm less able to feel the emotion. Okay, I continue to build up that tension, it can become like sunburn. Okay? Um, I sat, no big deal there. I told you I don't have any sunburn, but if I, I wouldn't get sunburn there, but if I got sunburn, okay, uh, then, ah, okay, just, hey, Bob, ah, ah. Yeah. Okay, that's what happens to the emotion. The other thing is it's because we become numb. Our capacity to experience and feel the emotion goes away and becomes numb. Okay, become okay. The second kind of emotion I call conceptual emotion. That's emotion that comes from thought. The first kind, momentary, comes from our perception, whatever we're paying attention to. So if you're in an emotional situation, okay, I remember I did a, a tour with the EMT back when they were starting a program at LCC to ask them to do a stress management workshop for EMT, so I was able to drive along with the ambulance. And there was a guy uh, whose daughter was the same age as this young girl who had an accident in North Turkey, which is when they took her to the hospital. Okay. During the time that he had to get her on the stretcher and that, he was just totally focused on what he had to do. Okay. After we left the hospital, then he started thinking, oh my gosh, she has to do that. That thought triggered the emotion. Okay. But if you shift your perception, the emotion dissipates. That's very different than trying to stop the emotion. Okay, I'm going to let this bother me. Now I've tensed up and I've blocked the emotion and I don't feel it, but it's building up. And it's feeding crisis mode. You do that long enough, it can lead to panic attacks, depression, all kinds of other things. Okay, so conceptual emotion tends to be nasty unless it's something that's connecting us. And that's the other function of emotion. Okay? Emotions connect us with other people. Each person everywhere in the world has the same capacity for the same emotions. God only knows what kind of these attributes. Okay. But we experience the exact same emotions and have the capacity to experience the same emotions. We don't have to say, I've been there, and it doesn't matter that I whether I had PTSD or not, I can feel what people in war have felt because I've been with them. And I just open that to them and I can feel it for a moment. For a fraction of a second, but then I let go. That's horrifying. Absolutely horrifying when some of these people have experienced it. But it's momentary. Now the focus is on how do we help these people. Okay, they have to take that moment and feel it. And when you make that connection, then there's a trust. Then there's an understanding. The emotions give us trust and understanding. They're very important and very powerful. And to be objective and block them out takes away some of our emotions. And it diminishes our ability to do that. So emotional balance is to be open. Okay. And to allow emotions to come through, recognize whether they fit or are helpful. Okay, let them go if they don't, or if they and focus on the ones that bring us together and, and that help facilitate our work. So if you look at what happened to this this guy who was in seclusion, okay, Sympathetic nervous system was overcharged. Okay, well, perception. I'm sorry, let me back up. One more part of the mind is I want to talk to you about perception. Okay? There are three aspects of perception that are helpful to understand how it works. I call it frame, filter, and focus. And kind of tie into what I've already been talking about. Okay? The frame, this is a frame. I don't have a picture on this frame. But let's say I had a picture of, uh, of while I'm in office, I had a picture of the moon rising over the, over the ocean, okay, at night. And, and so, but you can't see what's over here. This is the frame. There might be a boat over here, okay? 
There might be someone drowning over here. Okay? You don't see it. It's in the frame. And that's how our perceptions work. You do not see what's in your frame, and we all have frames. Okay? We have frames that are based on our expectations, based on our beliefs, based on our conceptual understanding. Okay? And that's what we see. There was a, a documentary um, on PBS about this whale that, that came into a harbor uh, in, in the Canadian coast and just connected with people. Just had this emotional bond with people. And these scientists said, you have to ignore them. There's a thousands of dollar fine if you interact with this whale. And the poor whale was showing all signs of depression. <laughs> but these experts were saying, okay, I've been working with, the, with whales for 25 years. They don't have emotion. Well, he has a frame of doing research. Research can't measure emotion. Okay? Uh, and it was really unfortunate that this whale suffered for a long time because the experts saw it. But it creates a frame. So if you start with the concept, you create the frame. So the healthy frame is one that's flexible. Okay? But what happens when we're out of balance is the frame becomes rigid. And when people do out of balance and they're in their high stress time, they go back to what worked before. Okay, that's the safest thing. Everything in crisis mode is about survival and safety. Okay, that really wipes out creativity. It wipes out the ability to solve problems effectively. It wipes out the ability to see the large perfect picture. It wipes out the ability to make contact with other people in a meaningful way. Okay, so that's the frame. The next is the filter, and that's emotional. The filter is the color. Okay. So if I put a red filter over this and had red writing up there, you could read. Okay. You don't see a red light for color rose colored glasses. Okay. Uh, and a dark filter, which is what happens in depression and, and a lot of the imbalance and negativity, um, makes everything look dark. You don't see the hole. It's not there. Okay. The key with the filter is to have a clear filter, but you can experience other people's filter. You get a sense of that how they see it, how they feel about it. Okay, so that allows that connection. And then the third part of perception is the focus. Okay, the focus is simply what you pay attention to. And hopefully you're all paying attention to me right now. Okay? <laughs> uh, but there's lots of other things you can pay attention to and you can shift that. And what happens when we get out of balance and we build up tension is, as I said earlier, the focus becomes narrow and it can easily scatter. Okay, it's, it's like it, it gets stuck. It's like Velcro. I'm focusing on that and then I'm focusing over there, and I'm focusing over there. Oh my God, I got this. And it shifts all over the place, and you wind up wasting incredible amounts of time. It's amazing what you don't see when you're out of balance, and you don't know that you don't see it. Okay. Um, the Army did some research on this, uh, and they, I mean, they're preparing people to fight. Okay. And they did this study in Berlin, and they had these people on a flight. And they had to fill out these forms. It was a test of, it involved a certain amount of cognitive ability. But there were significantly more errors on the forms when they thought their flight was in danger. It wasn't actually in danger, but the, all the people thought it was in danger. And they made a lot more errors. Okay. They had radio technicians, trained guys to, to fix radios. Okay? They gave them the illusion that they were in a combat situation. It took three, two to three times longer to do a same repair on a radio that they had done before. Okay. Stress does not make you more efficient. That's a myth. That it has a, it's a very physiological, narrow frame. Okay, the challenge can make you stronger, but that's not what tension is about. Okay, you might for a few seconds, if you're, if you're dealing with a bear, okay, that's going to help. If you're dealing with human situations, most of the time, 99.999% of the time, it works against you. Okay? So you've got the body, the tension narrows the frame. Okay, darkens the focus, or darkens the filter, I'm sorry, and, and fixes or scatters the focus. So you see less of what's going on, less of what's happening. So what can you do about this? Okay. You start with the body. That's the simplest. That's the most efficient. There's a lot of techniques out there that talk about you know, mind over body. And it makes some sense, but quite frankly, only a small percentage of people, in my experience, can really do it, and it takes a lot of work. And ultimately, you're getting the same outcome in your body from my observations as, as you might as well start there. Okay. It's way more efficient. If 
Remember what's going wrong with the body is the sympathetic overload. Sympathetic nervous system is stuck on, parasympathetic is not doing anything. That's why you can't sleep, that's why food is a problem. Okay, you eat way too much, you're a little upset, whatever. Okay, you're not digesting it, you're, you're, your body is not in balance. Okay? So, if this is stuck on, the solution is to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay? That stops it right there. And it actually does. Within a minute, you stop the buildup of tension. You don't recover that quickly, unfortunately. But you can stop the buildup of tension within a minute. And here's how it works. Okay? The right vagus nerve is about the size of your thumb. Okay? Wraps around the esophagus, and the diaphragm is the muscle at the bottom of the lung, shaped like a parachute. There's an opening in the back of the diaphragm, the esophageal hiatus. The esophagus and the right vagus nerve pass through that. And what I found over a period of years of observation, just paying attention, why does this work, what's going on, trying to figure it out, is you get the rhythm of the diaphragm. Very precise, three to four seconds up, three to four seconds down. Okay? You get that, no pause, no breath hold. That's a different technique for a different purpose. Okay? Slow, continuous movement, you're stimulating the right vagus nerve. Okay? If it's too fast, it doesn't work. Um, if it's too slow, my understanding is why it doesn't work is that you're using your muscles to control the movement. Okay, and the sympathetic nervous system is using energy. But if it's a natural, easy rhythm, within a minute, you can observe a difference. If I see three breaths, when I'm teaching this in a clinical session, I see three breaths, okay, I ask the person, are you feeling any different? Yeah. Now, if you stop doing it, stress hormones are going to jump the sympathetic nervous system right back in. Okay. So what you have to do is you have to keep stimulating it a number of times throughout the day for a number of days. And that depends on the severity of tension. That can take as long as two to four weeks. Okay. Uh, my students just finished a, uh, an assignment where they have to practice this and three other techniques that I'll explain to you uh, for 10 consecutive days. Okay. And that's generally enough time. Some of them I, I suggest do a little bit more afterwards, but it's generally enough time where I see some significant changes and differences. Actually, that's the sign of the today. And I just read a couple of them this morning, and, and the, the feedback was, wow, I feel more calm. I just don't get stressed out. I, I'm more efficient. One thing that, that invariably someone says, or a number of them say, is I got more done in less time. And I had to add an hour a day to do this assignment. How did that happen? happened because you became more efficient, you became more aware, you saw a larger picture more clearly. Okay, because when the vision is fragmented, yes? I just want to say that um, this was like a few years ago. I just came in and did a um, early sleep, and I mm -hmm. got some ideas, so I just want to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's very important for sleep. The other part that happens with sleep is that your mind, okay, because you've got this build up of tension, so your mind starts thinking about what's wrong, okay, and that creates more tension. And you know, if you're chasing, being chased by the air, you might have to fall asleep. Okay, so you have to do something else with the mind. Okay, so the natural rhythm of breathing, I have a video on this, and I also have a video on, and it was just a stroke of luck, uh, the nursing uh, department at LCC uh, suggested a student for me, and she was perfect for, for the video that we made because I wanted to demonstrate what to do when you can't do it. Okay, <laughs> and I just figured this out over a number of years clinically, if someone couldn't learn it. And, Probably, and in my situation, everyone is coming in in a lot of discomfort, so probably half the people would take would need a second session to figure out, you know, I had to figure out what wasn't working, okay? And so nothing worked with her until the last thing I tried. Okay, so it's perfect. It's a real life video of a person who had trouble learning natural rhythm breathing. Okay, and then the last technique, and you can see. Um, in terms of going to sleep and learning to, to control your, your thoughts and your mind, there's a very simple trick for that. And it helps to understand how your mind works in order to employ this trick. Okay? Now, they, they, they tend to use the word that our mind is plastic. And I don't really like that term because plastic is fixed. This is plastic. Okay? It's molded and it's solid. And I can melt it and turn it into something else, but that's pretty complicated. I prefer to say our mind is forming. Actually, our brain is forming, and there's clear evidence for this. There's not really any controversy about that. Our brain is formed by its experiences. Connections between neurons were made based on our experience. 
we all have an experience of English. I don't know if any of you speak other other languages, but there's no problem with us communicating because we all have those words. Okay? If I was in Russia right now, a small portion of me was understanding what I was saying. Like, what am I doing here? Okay? It's a totally different experience because they don't have that in their brain. Okay? Um, so think of, I like to use the, the, the analogy of rows. Uh, and it's actually pretty accurate because there are specific connections between neurons that form a memory or a thought. Okay, so um, if I had passed any of you um, in a grocery store on the way up here or something, um, and um, I wouldn't recognize you again, okay? Um, there's just one little connection and then no reinforcement and a whole bunch of people that I meet in the meantime, no idea, okay? If I see some of you this afternoon, okay, having looked at your faces, I will remember you. If I don't see you again for two years, I won't remember you most likely, okay? Because you need the repetition on the road, okay? And the more you travel that road, okay, then it becomes automatic. So think of your mind as an empty field, okay? Um, you walk across the field, you've got the beginning of the path. Okay, you walk back the same way, it starts to build, okay? So if every time you go to the field, that's how you go. It's like when I walk to my neighbor's house, there's a path that I've used for 25 years. Okay? And I never walk any other way. Um, it's just the way we go. And so when you get to the field, you're going to be drawn to the path that you're going to go. And that's going to create your frame, and your filter, and it's going to define your focus. But let's say I don't like this path. Okay? Uh, in terms of our analogy, it's got mud and play united. Some dirty and itchy all the time. <laughs> okay? But that's how we get across the field. Oh, man. Okay, well, so let's look at the whole field. And let's choose a spot that we can get across in a few seconds. Okay, and let's go back and forth on that spot a thousand times a day. We do that for a week, two weeks. Okay, within a week, that path is as well worn as the one I've been traveling for years. Okay, now I have a choice. Okay, I go to this path. Oh, I don't like mud and I think I'll go where there's wildflowers next to you. And you create that. You create it with what I call a rhythm phrase. You choose a phrase that makes you feel good. Okay? Something that fits. Something that's easy with you. One of my, my clients 16 years ago came up with peace and calm. Moon, our moon and stars, peace and calm. As you breathe in, moon and stars. As you breathe out, peace and calm. Defines the same rhythm that you breathe as you breathe for practice. But you also use it in your rhythm with your activity. So, you know, you're walking to wherever. Moon and stars, peace and calm. Moon and stars, peace and calm. Okay? You can easily do that a thousand times a day. Do it while you're doing dishes, while you're taking a shower, while you're driving, while you're walking somewhere, up and downstairs. You just find yourself saying it out of habit because you established it. So now you've got your mind and your body working together to restore balance. When you use the combination of the, of the, nat of the natural fluid of breathing and the rhythm phrase, you're stopping stress in two places. And what will happen then is the third type of emotion will start to resolve. And this, remember I said there were four types. The first was momentary, the second was conceptual, Third is structural. And that comes out of either habits of tensing to block an emotion. Okay, I'm not going to cry. It works. I stopped crying. But now, if I do that every day or a number of times a day, I've got a pattern of tension here that won't allow me to cry. Okay? But as I restore balance to the autonomic nervous system, as I stop the pattern of tension, as I allow the natural rhythm to move, those emotions will resurface. Now they come into the moment again. This is what happens in PTSD. Okay? The worst thing you could do at that time is to talk about it, to think about it. Because now you're reliving the event. So one of the first things I would, I would do in working with people with PTSD is you don't need to talk about the incident. As a matter of fact, I'm not convinced that, you, that people can. I wouldn't say this necessarily. But I find that there's a combination. That when you, you do talk about things for clarity or they, they're just describing it, that they, they mix together, it's like a soup. The emotions aren't 
in a linear fashion, okay, in terms of a time frame, okay, this happened when I was 12 years old, and this happened when I was in Vietnam. They get mixed together. It's like making pea soup, okay? I, I add a pound of peas in the morning when I started the soup, and, and I need a little more, so I add another half pound, and now I need a dinner, and I can't tell where these peas came from. Okay? Is it the morning batch or the afternoon batch? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Okay, what matters is what color tastes, and what matters was structural emotion as soon as you let go. Now, if you're building up tension, structural emotion breaks loose. Okay, and that's one of the worst parts about PTSD. But as you restore balance, okay, the structural emotion will come up. And my experience is very consistent. It comes up in times and places where you can handle it. So a, a classic example is a guy that I, I worked with who was in Vietnam. Um, it's absolutely horrific experiences. Um, and, but he came back, got a job, got married, raised a family, had a good life, retired, moved up north, and started having panic attacks and flashbacks. And so I was able to see him very early in that process, which was a good, a good thing. Okay. And we only had three sessions. He had to drive some distance to come in, so we, we kept up with John and I explained the first session how this all worked. And uh, on the second session, we kind of reinforced it. And then I said, call me. Okay. If you have any questions, but you know what to do now. Okay. And he called up and said, okay, I was sitting on my deck in the sunshine, beautiful day, just relaxing, and all of a sudden someone's behind that bush was blowing away. And I did what you said. Okay, I put my feet down, okay, I explained this part later. I did the natural rhythm of breathing, and I had an unbelievably horrific 30 seconds. explained to them, as I had before, that will happen again and again over a period of months. And it's like a very severe trauma. It can take up to a year. I've never seen it take longer than a year unless there's complicating factors. But it comes up, you breathe, you ground, you let the momentary experience pass, and it's gone. So that will happen as you restore balance if there's a buildup of, of structural emotion. Okay, that's emotional flux and the tension. But if you turn it back into emotional <coughs> emotion, it'll go. The fourth kind of emotion is as relevant to our discussion here. That's the kind of emotion involved in, in motivation. It's a, I call it a shaping emotion because it shapes your, your view and your picture and your connection to things. So, uh, that's a, a different part, but it, it, is, it is an emotional experience. Okay, so we've got body. Mind and perception. And emotion. Okay? What happens when you're out of balance, okay, is the body increases tension in the mind, increases tension in the perceptions, that creates more tension in the body, so it's going back and forth. The body blocks emotion, you make conceptual emotion, over here, creates more tension in the body, and it just keeps on cycling and building up until you stop. Yes? I just have a question, but this is going to bug me. My, is it, you have to, someone has PTSD, do they need to talk about it? No. no. Because my uncle was a prisoner of war in World War II, and never to anyone, it's told anyone and about what happened. And if you, if you could feel what happened to him, you would totally understand. The other part of that is people who've been in war situations have also done things that they are deeply ashamed of. And he was a, he never, ever got, like, I, I don't, he was a very nice, calm person, and yeah, just honestly, yes, so he obviously was able to overcome that, yeah. I guess. Well, I, I, I not knowing know. him, I don't know how much he buried and how much he was able to overcome, but but if it did surface, the, the and, and I'm just very clear about this, and that's one of the problems with PTSD therapy, is they try to get people to talk about it. And, and, and I've seen so many people who are made worse by that. Okay? They claim a 50% success rate, and people say, yeah, I felt better for a while, but then I see them after they get bottom again. So I'm, I'm even skeptical of that. Right? But the thinking about it creates a conceptual emotion. And this is horrific stuff. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, I know what it feels like to be locked in a trunk. Okay, for 36 hours after you've been beaten. Okay, I, I felt that for a half a second. Okay, I let that go. Okay, and and you learn 
learn to do that. Okay? Um, but when you talk about it, you're still in the trunk. <laughs> okay? You're back in there again. You're creating the same thing all over. Okay? So you're stimulating it with your thoughts. So the thing that I consistently say in working with PTSD is separate the thought from the emotion. Allow the emotion to be, but give your mind somewhere else to go. And that's where a rhythm phrase comes in very handy. One that gives you a sense of peace and calm. Okay? And it never takes longer than, I mean, a minute is on the extreme edge of how long it takes when someone is grounded and breathing. Okay? Um, rarely does it last a minute. A minute and a half is probably the longest I've ever seen. If you resist it, you can keep it going all day. Okay? Because you're emptying the cup while you're filling it up. Okay. You're tensing, okay, and thinking about it as you're crying and letting it go. <laughs> okay, that doesn't let go of anything. <laughs> okay, it's deep, it's letting go. Okay. I've mentioned the term grounding a couple of times, and I want to want to make sure that I cover that uh, because that's another of the techniques that's, that's very helpful, and maybe it's something I think we have some time where we can we can practice that. Okay, uh, and I actually I'd like to go through the the natural rhythm of breathing and the grounding. I can try. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, yeah, okay fine. Um, grounding is a simple exercise that allows you to be aware of where tension is in your body. Okay, so usually, for most people, it's initially uncomfortable because it tells you where your tension is and tension's not comfortable. Okay, that's okay. But as you work with it, it also helps you to let go of the patterns of tension, and then you can begin to realize when you're tensing a little bit. Oh, you know. Oh, it's something stressing me right now. Okay, my knee's tensing. Okay, that that gives you an awareness and it puts you in a touch with the moment. Okay, our body is in present time. It's right here. Okay, our mind. You can go to Europe and back, and that as long as it took me to say it. <laughs> then you can jump to Australia. You go to the moon in your mind. Okay, as far in outer space as you can imagine. Our body has to get there and get back. Okay? And everything we do, we have to start in the present moment. Okay? You don't get to the future by only focusing on the future. You've got to start here and figure out how to get there. And what balance does is allow you to see where you are and the journey. And what happens so much when we're out of balance is we see the goals and the objectives and where you want to go, but we're, we're worried about it, dealing with this, and we're trying to jump over here, but because of it, we're going back here, and we can't, we're not starting where we are. You have to start where you are. These are the present circumstances, but these circumstances are wrong, and this person screwed up, and that never should have happened. Okay, I'm not there anymore. This is where we are. Okay, how do we get there? Well, that's in the way. Okay, well, let's see, I'm over here. I am moving further away from where I want to go, but It's simple as that. Many times. I remember I worked at a clinic once, and there was one of the, or it was a hospital, and there was a person that was setting up the scheduling, and there were seven different units at the, at the facility, it was a residential facility. And she had was given the task by her boss to set up a schedule so that they had coverage for people who didn't show up. So she had to pull from another unit, bring in extra staff to a unit each time. And they had these charts all over her wall, these big the whole wall covered with this stuff with names. And, I mean, this is before the computers. This is the 70s. And she's trying to figure out this system because everyone's complaining about it and hates it and doesn't like it. Has an extra staff and are complaining, well, we need the extra one if, if no one else does more than this person does. And I'm trying to, to I wanted to start this program and I wanted to sit down with her and, and go over it. She says, I can't. Work on it. It's driving me crazy. And it's like weeks went by. She's still more charts and piecing down and looking those up. And I said, well, what are you working on? I've got to come up with the schedule you know, so that we've got coverage. And I said, well, we've got seven units, seven days a week. Just pull from one unit each day. And that was perfect. Okay? But that's what happens when you're out of balance. She did not see it. And I fully understand how she did not see it because she was so focused here and then pulled over there. Well, but that person did not see it. I didn't see it. When you're grounded, you see where you are. As soon as you're building up tension, your mind is pulled the past or the future. You have to start where you are. Okay? So let's just take a little bit of practice 
And again, I won't have time to, to work a lot individually, but it is on the video on, on the website. Let's take a little bit of practice with the uh, diaphragmatic, or uh, actually I don't use the term. That was a mistake. I, I used to call it diaphragmatic breathing, but people do all kinds of things that they call diaphragmatic breathing, including breath holding. And the key is the movement of the diaphragm, the natural root rhythmic movement of the diaphragm. And it's three or four seconds now. <coughs> so I'm going to have you put your feet flat. And that's a key. Uh, I, I say again and again in the counseling session, keep your feet flat. Okay? Because when your feet are flat, it's hard to tense up your legs. Okay? And people come in and they're doing this, or they're doing this, or they're, they're doing this, or they're, you know, they're pulled up in all kinds of ways. And we always tense up. Okay? Tension pulls away from the ground, it pulls us out of the moment. Okay? We don't tense down. We become uptight. No one becomes downtight. <laughs> you can see it. You can see it. Okay? So actually, back to the grounding, as long as I'm on that. Um, the key to grounding is to break the pattern of tension. So if I'm tensing up, the muscles are pulling away from the ground. Okay? So simple physiology, activate the opposite muscles. So if you want to stop tensing up, bounce down. That's what we're going to practice after you do three. We'll all demonstrate it first. Okay? Now this may look a little silly. You can't necessarily do it. You know, in front of your boss in an important meeting. Um, <laughs> but you've done before, okay? And you can press your feet down as you're doing. But basically, the opposite muscles are working and I'm running with tension. But essentially, my skeleton is holding me up. My muscles have to work minimally to maintain my posture. Now my muscles are working. As soon as I lock my knees, my muscles are working all the way up to my neck. I, I, I played around with, with you know, measuring muscle tension and just had someone standing in the grounding stance and lock their knees, and you could feel the tension go up in the knees. Okay. Well, you can just keep on your neck and try to understand. Okay. So you bounce down. Okay. Knees are bent. Pelvis is over my feet. Okay. If it's forward, okay. now I'm, I'm using this to hold me up. Okay. If it's back, I'm using this to hold me up. If I'm over my feet, my pelvis is over my feet, my spine comes up to my pelvis, my head sits on top of my spine, my shoulders hang over my head. I don't have to use tension to hold me up. Okay, I'm not wasting any energy. So let's do the natural rhythm. Feet flat. Now just put your hand in your belly and simply watch your hand as you breathe. Don't try to force it. And slowly pay attention to what's happening. As you breathe in, don't push it, but just allow it to be a little bit deeper. As you breathe out, let yourself relax a little bit more. And let's just add a simple rhythm phrase, peace and, as you breathe in, calm as you breathe out. Peace and calm. Peace. Don't judge whether you're doing it right. However you're doing it is what you need to go through to be able to learn to do it properly. If you have dice on the road, you try to skip it and learn to do it right. Peace. When I worked at the residential facility, um, and you had to hold someone in a basket hold when they're out of control, and, and so they don't hurt somebody else or, or themselves. Okay, and so my hand is on their wrist here, and my other hand is on their other wrist, and then my my back, my chest is against their back, and I'm holding them like that. Okay, and what I found is is that this hand is right by the diaphragm, this arm. Okay, so I would feel their breath through my chest, and when they exhale, I would pull them. And they took 
free breaths that I didn't stimulate naturally in rhythm. Uh, and I was never there for 20 years. Okay. No people that hold me for 45 minutes and stall me. Okay. But as soon as the parasympathetic nervous system is activated, they were going to fight me. Okay. They just don't know. Okay. So the key is rhythm. And it can take practice. I've seen people where it takes a couple of weeks. That's okay. It's worth it. Whatever, whatever, however long it takes, it's absolutely true. Okay, so let's do some ground work. Okay? Everybody's got to stand up. You, know? <laughs> you can't do it sitting down. Uh, you can just press your feet down and you bring your hands up, bring it out, put your pelvis all the way back in the chair. Okay? But this is the stand up here. So you start with you bend your knees. Okay? Now, most people, when they bend their knees, bring the pelvis forward, but then you need to lower back there. Work. So you, the, the clinical term, I think, is called stick your butt up. Okay. Um, you don't stick way out, but, but you let it go back and you just go forward. And the bottom line is, is you want your pelvis right over your feet. Now this is really impossible to do on high heels, so if you're wearing high heels, it's going to turn you off. Because it really throws you off. And actually, I'm going to get all the cereal high heels. And you don't really turn the ground when you're wearing high heels. Okay. Yeah, and then just start to bounce. One of my students uh, uh, described a time when she was uh, at McDonald's and she just had a little bit of time and, and there was a big long line and there was a brand new staff person waiting on people and she was getting real uptight and she heard some music on the radio and oh, she ground. And so she just started bouncing. And, and by the time she got in line, she was able to say something to the new person that really helped put her at ease. And to, to walk. It looked like we're ADD. <laughs> no, actually, this is the opposite of ADD. Everyone I've ever worked with with a diagnosis of ADD has an excessive amount of attention. And quite frankly, in my limited experience, I mean, I've worked with a few thousand people in my time, maybe a hundred or so with ADD diagnoses. When I got rid of the tension, there was not a problem anymore. They had to adapt to the situation, maybe because they were high energy. But um, yeah, this is the opposite of ADD. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can shake up your hands, shake up your shoulders, shake up your legs. Okay. Shaking. You can't shake and tense at the same time. So just trying to get the tension. And if you just do this, okay. Let me give you one more step. Because if you can't do this because there's a chair in front of you, but I'll just show you. This this takes it another step further. I'll just do it partially. Okay. Exhale and drop down. Now I'm watching where my head is. I can't see my my feet. Okay, if I can see my feet, I'm tensing my neck. Okay, but I can continue to go down as far as I like. And basically, I can't tense up in this position. Okay, uh, if I tense up, I'm going to fall on my head. Okay, so I won't do it. So you have to let go of this position. And when you come up, you come up with a breath. Relax. Come up. Relax. Come up. Relax. That ground weight puts you in the way. Okay? And it's very helpful in dealing with the crisis situation or anything difficult. Or before my, my students do it before tests and things like that, and it, it helps a lot. Okay, yeah, go ahead and sit down. Actually, when I, when I worked at the facility, I was um, in Harold. I was given a unit that, uh, uh, where everybody who had problems with violence was sent. There were 700 residents at the facility, and everyone had problems with violence. And so we had 26 men in a room actually about this size. Um, and, you know, they could set each other off. And my office was right across, it was right on the other side of the wall. Okay? So the staff would <coughs> unlock the phone, because okay, the phone had to be locked up in the cage, okay, because it would have gotten torn off the wall. They'd call me and say, we need some help. And I said, well, don't bother doing that, because <laughs> that's, you know, just pound on the wall three times. Okay? Uh, and I'll know you need help. Okay? So I'm sitting at my desk. And they pound the wall three times, and here's what I would do. Okay. Now there's another psychologist who went running to the hall and jumped in and ran into help and got his jaw broke. I would help at all. <laughs> Didn't help him or the rest. This is what I would do. Okay, I would turn. This is exactly what it does. Okay. Meanwhile, I might hear a chair hit the wall. <laughs> Walking in, calm.
balance is catchy too. It's like a tom with tom comes up. And essentially had no problems from that point. As long as I was grounded and in balance, the bombs would just settle them down. And I worked the crisis line a lot. In the clinic where I would work, they would code, code 88, okay, someone's in the, in the reception area, you know, screaming or something like that. People would go running, okay, I would walk on the fence. Okay, and, and when I got there, then we would be done, okay. But when you're calm and in the moment, because anytime someone is not being threatened and being violent, they're out of the moment, okay. All you gotta do is bring it back. And the moment may be very scary. That's okay. It passes. Okay, we'll deal with that. We'll figure it out. Okay, we can deal with scary. We can deal with discomfort. Okay, we have to. It's part of life. Okay. Uh, discomfort doesn't throw us out of balance. Pain doesn't throw us out of balance. That's what people may say when they say stress is inevitable. I don't buy that stress is inevitable. I think pain is inevitable. At some point, we will have physical or emotional pain in our life if we live any time at all. Okay. Um, but we can have pain without stress. As a matter of fact, tension increases pain. Okay, and there's clear physiological explanation for why and how it works. Okay, so the key is to, is to experience the pain, release the tension, and let it be what it is. And I worked a lot with pain management being in, in a medical clinic. Um, and I found very consistent with people who had, we could drop the pain level three to four points. If it was at an eight or a nine, um, we could get it to a five or a six just by getting rid of tension okay. and, and not fighting through those things. Yes? Quick question. Do, do any of these people around here, like how would you react to people that maybe would get frustrated? Was there strategy? You know, like I said, kind of people who would react to the situation quickly versus taking the time to think it and balance before you respond to the situation? Well, I never had that because it always worked. Um, and the frustration never works. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the frustration, if you come into a person who's agitated and you're frustrated, and, and I remember in, in uh, early care called me down once and there was this woman having panic attacks and, and the nurse had worked too many days in a row and was going in and, and uh, was exhausted and was saying, breathe, come on, breathe. That's <laughs> 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 It doesn't work, okay? And this works. And quite frankly, when you're in balance, you're not a very good target, okay? It's hard to be angry at someone who understands where you're coming from and is in balance. Okay? It's really hard. You have to work at it. You have to be mad, okay? And, and you won't hold on to it. So the understanding where it comes from is a key. And that brings me to another point that I want to talk about in terms of of perceptions and and what works, okay? Because there, I talked about brain filter and filter, brain filter and focus, how it works, but I want to talk about how, what works in terms of perception. And what I found is there are four aspects of perceptions that work. Four aspects, I call them components of clear perception. The idea of a perception is to see a larger picture more clearly, okay, from the present moment. Four pieces to that. The first is compassion. Compassion is to see what another person sees and to feel what they feel in the moment. Doesn't mean you agree with them. Okay. I worked with a man um, early in my career who had been molested a six-year-old girl. Okay, and we had gone from the jail and he came in there. He did it because he hated it. And he meant it. That was a real hope, okay? So I had to back off from that. It actually took me a month to work on myself to develop compassion for him. To understand something happened to him to close his heart so that he was able to do that kind of act. Okay? And when I got to that place myself, he started crying. Now he's still in Jackson Prison, to be sure, because he had life sentence here probably 15, 20 years ago. Um, but I have hope for him because in crying, Feel you can't do something like that. The only way you can do something like that is to not feel blocked with me. Okay, so it's a compassion.
compassion keeps us in touch with our shared humanity. Okay? And when you see how another person sees something, they don't have to defend against it. Okay? As long as you see that it makes sense. I totally disagree. I don't buy what that, we don't say that part, but I can see that that makes sense. Okay? So I mean, a common thing I would say on the crisis line when someone's suicidal is, well, that's one option. It is. It's the only option they see, but you try to stretch the frame a little bit. Okay? So compassion. The next component, <coughs> these are exclusive, they overlap and they're all part of the whole, is personal responsibility. What opportunities, responsibilities, what is my ability to respond to the situation, and what is the ability to respond of whoever is involved in the situation, and how can we make that fit? How can we see everyone able to contribute? Most of all, what can I do? And where people get stuck is in blame and judgment, and yeah, but she just got her act together, my life would be great, you know, um, what's wrong with him? Creates more imbalance, just creates tension. Okay, he's like that, but what can I do? And how can I potentially manage <coughs> that time? How can I potentially reduce that person's stress? How can I potentially help them see a larger picture of more clearly? Okay. And I do that. Okay. I worked a lot with um, one half of a couple. I also did some marriage counseling, but just the, the nature of it and where I worked, and it was hard to get both people in. And I found that that wasn't a, a hindrance at all. I mean, it was, there's a lot more you can accomplish with two people, but one person alone can easily repair a relationship. And this is the way I describe it. It's like, it's like you have these defenses that you build up. You're protecting yourself, okay? So you put up a wall, okay? okay? And, and you literally do. There's a tension wall that you can see, okay? But you put up walls. You got these two walls. Okay? But the tension is increasing between the walls, so the walls are getting thicker. So if you think of like water is pressing on the walls, it's on walls putting in a river, and the river keeps on getting more and more water, the floods are coming down from the mountains, okay, and the walls are getting thicker and thicker and thicker, and that's what's happening when people get into a crisis in a relationship. So what you do, you just take down the wall. You take down the wall, you stop being defensive. You just simply let it go, and you see, understand where the other wall is coming from. Okay, so you choose to be loving in the way you can be loved. And then now, being loving, this is a little bit of a different topic, means taking the best interests of the other person in heart. So being loving doesn't mean do what they want, okay, because that can be not loving. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is to live in a relationship, especially a safe relationship. Clearly the most loving thing. But if a person is going in a direction that's harmful to them, to sustain that in a relationship, but you take down that wall and you choose to love. You choose to see it from their perspective. The water finds its own level. This wall becomes superfluous. And what I found is it usually took a period of months, okay, three or four months, to get the wall in there. And if it didn't, then it was very clear that it was a okay, and that you know, what you did for me would be another message sent for this person to take down that wall and be in their life. That's our personal response. What can I do? The other part is hope. Okay. Hope is seeing that every situation can be handled in an optimal way. There's a best way to handle any situation. And that's all we're It isn't some, you know, high in the sky, everything's going to turn out wonderful, or things will be fine. No, that's sometimes they're not fine. But there is a best way to handle this situation. Okay. And hope opens up. It opens up our see the, the potential and, and the possibilities. Okay. And, and it can become a habit. Uh, Emily Dickinson said, hope is the thing with feathers that perches on the soul and sings the song without the words and never stops at all. And when that becomes part of our way of seeing the world, we see a different world. We see a world of opportunity and potential problems, yes. But then the key is, well, how do we do it? There's another uh, Chinese writer who put it nicely. Lu Xuan said, Hope is like a path in the countryside. Originally there is nothing, but as people walk this way again and again, a path appears. Okay? And that fits with our understanding of time. 
you create a path in your brain of hope. And then this is how you see the world. And you do the same with all four of the perceptions. Okay. And the fourth of them is humility. Humility is basically reality. Okay? It's seeing the interconnectedness and that we're all involved in this. It's, it's having what I call uh, an us frame rather than a me frame. Okay? When someone has a me frame and they're very self-centered, it's like looking in a mirror. Okay? And it's just about what I'm doing and what's going on. And you're not picking up any information. So it's very inefficient, very unhelpful in, most of, in all situations, basically. But with humility, we see our interconnectedness. We see that everyone has some potential and some input in some way that they can so those four perceptions that work, components of clear perception, come about as we restore balance. And if we are proactive and just choose to think about things in that way, and you can use that as a problem-solving approach, and I use it with my students and, and, and a lot with my clients, okay? Well, let's look at it from their perspective. What is their frame, okay? How could he treat me like this? Well, let's look at that. How is it framed in Trump? How did, how did it get like that? Oh, wow, I understand that. Okay, now how can we enlarge the frame? The only way to enlarge the frame is to get in at yourself. Okay, you can't say, hey, look here, see? See that? See? See? <laughs> they don't see it. Okay, but if you're here <coughs> and you stretch it a little bit, So the bottom line is balance, if you're to sum it up, is to see clearly with an open heart. When you see clearly with an open heart, you can be fully yourself. All of your resources are available to you. Okay? You can connect with other people in ways that can make a meaningful contribution to their life. Okay? See clearly with an open heart. To the extent that you're out of balance, okay, you have a narrower frame, and your heart is closed. close. The tension will close your heart. Okay? And I think that's a big part of the problem with our world today. Is we have come to accept <coughs> that imbalance is the natural way of life. Okay? That that I mean that that our nature is to be aggressive. And competitive. <laughs> you know, there's a guy named Robert Sapolsky who did research on baboons, and, and the troop of baboons he studied was, was one of the most aggressive species known. And this was in Kenya. And he studied them for decades. Okay, he's out at Stanford. And the interesting thing, thing happened. He would he would shoot them with darts and take uh, you know, cortisol levels and you know test their stress levels, and he always kept track of who the, the alpha males were, and you know they would walk on the females and the lesser males, just random. I mean, just you know. No, nothing going on, just, well, I think I'll go, wow. <laughs> yes, this is what they did. Okay, it was kind of part of their routine. Um, and he couldn't figure out any, there was no threat or anything, he just was a way of serving his problem. Okay, and that's just what this baboon troop did, and they thought it was part of the nature. Well, somebody built a hunting lodge nearby, and uh, they put out all the rotten food in the dump. Okay, they had a bunch of rotten meat in there. And uh, all the alpha males ate the rotten meat. They all died. So the lesser males and the females took over the tree. And they did not revert to aggressive behavior over generations. And males, adolescent males, would come from other troops where they're getting walked on, okay, and join the new troop, which was part of the process that they all go through. And within a month or so, they were not aggressive. So the whole thought of this aggression can be a myth. And there's a guy named Stephen Hall who wrote a book called The Fall, who documented through anthropological and archaeological research that there is no evidence of human-to-human -human violence in the first 95% of human existence. It's only been in the last few thousand years that we've been at each other's throats. And he identifies how that happened, um, because there was a worldwide drought through most of the Middle East, or through, through the, most of the known world at that time. And uh, there were three tribes 
they became aggressive and started invading other men. The other tribes had no defense because they had no concept of human to human fighting, and so they wanted to conquer the world for much and much of it. Okay. And we've lived in fear ever since. Okay. And fear is the classic thing to throw us out of balance. Fear in the moment serves a useful purpose, but it's conceptual fear. You have lived in conceptual fear for a few thousand years. Yes? Um. Sometimes I look at newspapers, but more so cable news, and I swear that it just encourages that fear. Yeah, all the time. yeah, because it draws our attention. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, if, if I say there's a killer bee up there, okay, <laughs> you're not going to be paying attention to anything else in the room. You're going to be doing <laughs> that. And now I put a little ad up here. Buy this. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at it. Okay. Yeah. It draws your attention. Yeah. They use it to to draw our attention. Um, we, uh, we live on 20 acres, and I planted a lot of trees and bushes, and back in 1992, I, I planted uh, a bunch of trees, and, and I had back injury and surgery, and uh, we had a drought, actually, the next year, and I didn't water them, and, and I thought most of them died, and one of them was a dollar tree, and it was just about this big, and uh, I just assumed it didn't pay attention. It was kind of back off the boundary, and I didn't walk back there very often in the weeds. But I had a, I always made a bowl, you know, so the water would roll down into the tree to feed it. And um, I was back in there a few years ago, just walking around in the spring, and there's that little dog with the tree. It's still there. And I bent it a little bit, and my God, it's been great. It's still alive. And I dug it up, and I put it in our garden, which is fenced in to keep out the deer. It's up for irrigation and real soft. And my wife said, why are you planting that chewed up, spindly stick? Because it's the dogwood tree from, you know, almost 20 years ago, okay? Um, and it's still alive. We just want to see what it'll do. So that dogwood tree is now taller than I am, okay? And it's flowered out. And last Christmas, it was covered with white berries, and there were 10 cardinals, five pairs of cardinals having their Christmas dinner on it. And it was just beautiful. I wanted to take a picture, but I thought, no, I'm enjoying the moment too much. <laughs> I don't want to miss it, okay? Now, if you think about it, what is the true nature of a dogwood tree? Is it to be a chewed up, spindly stick? Okay. No, it's to be tall and covered with berries and the cardinals and the other birds are drawn and it provides food and water. Okay. So the question I'll leave you with is, are we the equivalent of a chewed up, spindly stick? What would happen if we restore balance in our own lives? and with people that we know, and they did the same, and they did the 